Okay. Okay. My name is Darlene Barker, and I'm a grad student at UMass Lowell. I work under Dr. Lukowitz, who won't be joining us this evening. He's on vacation. So I'll be going over the research. So the agenda, I'll present uh, the inflammation problem that we see that we're trying to solve, our approach, some related works, and what we see for the future and conclusion. So the, I figure it's worth giving an origin story of where this all started. I was overseas thousands of miles away from my family. And on a call, I kept reaching for my daughter wanting to touch because we we're talking, listening to each other and that was missing. So I came back and my professor and I, we talked about it and why not? This is something we can work on. So intro. The first sense that we as humans encounter at birth is touch. At birth, you know, in some cultures, you put the baby on the mom and that's that first feel, that first connection that we form. This is not about the psychology of all of it. It's, it's an idea. So with touch, we're able to experience emotions on a deeper level. So if we, we saw a cookie, we smelt a cookie, it doesn't have the same effect as if we had the cookie in our hand. That's, that's the idea. <laughs> now, in VR, we're trying to recreate that tactile sensation of feeling. Okay. Now, research areas that can benefit from this, studies of how our brain works, how we classify things that we touch, feel, uh, how different cultures process, regard, touch. Uh, touch in one part of the world may not be the same in another. Um, in art and design, being able to say you're at the museum, you know, you can't touch anything. It'd be nice to feel a piece of art as opposed to just looking at it on a pedestal. And long distance communication where this all started. Oh shoot, I'm sorry, I did not share my screen. My apologies. Yes, I got a, I'm gonna get a minus E for this anyways. Okay. So can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back, just, just go back a bit and show what you're missing. <laughs> So Emotions VR, my name, my professor, my advisor, the agenda, and the origin kind of thing. So now here we are. So this all started with a need to fill in long distance communication. And at the time I was taking a VR course and spoke to my advisor and we thought, why not? This could be interesting. So another area is marketing. Say you're, you're browsing Amazon looking at things, it would be nice to handle those things. Say you're shopping for uh, a new drill, it would be nice to pick it up <laughs> or fabric, whatever. But I'll, I'll touch on that later. And social psychology. So, we're able to watch movies, watch activities occur. We're able to play games. We're able to participate in shows. We're able to be there in VR to a certain degree. We can do college campus visits. We can read bedtime stories to our kids. We can do virtual showrooms, you know, go, go places that we usually, you know, would go in person, but in VR. The, the things that we're not able to do is feel an object, 
So in VR, I could potentially pick this object up or the arm goes through it because I can't pick it up. Um, but we cannot feel, we cannot experience that feeling of the object. We can't feel, experience the feeling of touch. So you touch your arm or someone else's arm and you can feel that you touch the person or you can feel the reaction to being touched, uh, to touching the person, or you can feel being touched. Okay, so these are the things you're not able to do in VR. So what we're seeing as the problem is that we're using sound and visuals to recreate that feeling of presence. And here's the idea. If you picked it up, then you touched it. So in your mind, you touched it, but you really didn't because you can't really feel what you touch. Uh, so we're, we believe that touch is important. Now, touch is multidimensional in the sense that there is so much data to collect. I'm sorry, emotions is multidimensional and touch isn't. Yeah. Anyway, so emotions is multidimensional in the sense that it's not the same for everyone, but there are things that we can, data we can collect, and it's a lot of data that we can collect, and somehow using machine learning, be able to classify emotions and touch enhances emotions. So there's no technical language to touch. There's no definition in the sense of other than you feel it, you touch it kind of thing. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those things that we find is important for a more immersive VR experience. And by bringing, being able to simulate the feeling of touch, we're bringing the body into the equation. We're bringing that third sense in where we, we already have um, the auditory, the, um, the visual, now touch. So we're three fifths of the way there. Now, why is emotions important? It helps with our sense of connection, our sense of presence in, in our world, it enhances our experience. Current offerings. So at this time, we're able to say we bumped into something in the world, we can feel vibration through our controller. Uh, I have, ah, there is my other prop. So we can feel vibration. Okay, that's cool. That's awesome, but it would be nice to do more. With haptic gloves and fingertip devices, we're able to we're able to feel and manipulate the world through our hands or fingers, simulate movement in that part of body. So that's cool. Now there's a partial body coverage that. I think TaxSuit X offers, um, it's a vest and gloves. So that's really cool. Now there's a full body version, which ideally would be awesome to play with, but before we get there, there's a lot of computation that is required before we get to the, the, the act of connecting the haptic devices and moving forward. So, our big idea is to aggregate emotions data in the sense where, so <clears throat> I will go over the different sensors and things, but collecting sensory information from say three or four different sensors and each of them recreating an emotion now putting all of that together, how does that work? And that's where our 
research is focused on. How, the, how to aggregate all of that data, how to get it working to say you, well, I have a horrible drawing, but nah, I won't put it. So just think of, you have facial recognition data, you have speech data, you have brainwave data, and uh, maybe body temperature and some others. Now, each one of these, you can use a model to figure out what emotion is being portrayed. But then do they all come back with the same thing or do we need to alt adjust this in some way? So that's what we're mainly focused on. Now, doing all of that gives us a, a little black box to simulate tactile sensations. So it's, it's more like we have all this data we need to work on, but then we need the tool. But before we get to the tool, we need to figure out this, this ball of, of data. Now, smart garments. When I started this, I had this idea, you know, it would be good to have smart garments, something you could fold up into a little box. This is my, one of my sensors box. But, you know, something small enough, you put it in a box, take it off, put it on, plug it into your device, and off you go, you can simulate touch. That's the daydreamer. But in reality, we need to work on the data first. Now, all three of these things I just mentioned too, better immersion in VR. Now, things to think about. <clears throat> the first one would be types of touch and emotion. These, okay, so with touch, it could be a classical touch in that you initiate it. It could be an emotional, what you say, what you're hearing, um, how you say something. And then it would be the third type, physical, where you bump into, which is kind of similar to classical, but I'll, I'll go over that in a minute. But there's that. Then emotions, it could be physical and it could be environmental. And lack of a better name, our black box, I call it the agent. And it has nothing to do with AI or anything. I, I didn't want to call it the black box. And I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the agent. So the agent is where all the, um, all the sweet sauce is made, you know? Uh, and then some machine learning, aggregate data collection, in a way that the sensors are all working together, not against each other. And the giving and delivering of feedback, that refers to touch. So to set this up, okay, let's just imagine we're in a restaurant setting. It, it makes sense, so bear with me here, okay? Uh, we have a VR setting. What, that we're working with, okay? It's a restaurant, two parties are sitting at a table and you could have ocean or forest sounds in the background. And these two parties are the avatars in, in this exchange. And each avatar will express what that party is feeling from the, the data that's being collected in the background. So, and the avatar in real-time visual, it's, it gives a, a real-time visual look at what is actually happening in the background. So when you're sitting with someone, depending on their body language, how they're speaking or whatever, you're able to visually, you're able to see if they're happy, sad, whatever. And that's what we're trying to do with the avatar. So I already touched on this. So the, the user participant initiates the touch. Spoken word, that's the emotional touch. Throwing, moving objects, bumping into things, physical. Now, emotions, the underlying emotions and environmental effects. So <clears throat> a dark room versus a lighter room. Uh, 
a smoky room or how things can affect how people are feeling. So now we can look at classical touch. I'm gonna skip forward to show the diagram and then go back a bit. So this is the high level look at classical touch. There's a lot more wires and, and connections that are missing, but from a, a high level look, user one initiates touch. So there's two people sitting at the restaurant and you touch the other person's hand. Now before, down bottom here it says data will be collected before and after. So in a way to let the first person know, do you touch the person or not? Okay, so just quick look and we're gonna go backwards. All right, so classical touch, it's where one of the parties initiate touch, but in real life, before we touch someone, we usually have some kind of awareness of whether it's safe to, you know, touch a person's arm or not. I know it's listed as a second thing, but throughout the whole experience, what we're aiming for is to have that feeling that you do in real life, to be able to see how someone is doing at some level. Uh, that's what, so it's kind of a background function running, but it's still listed. That's the awareness before you touch. And you receive a response before the person that's touched give, um, respond, the background information that's running gives you this response. And, and one of the things that we wanna test is Will what the awareness show you match the response? So, so here we are, back to the drawing board. <laughs> Initial touch goes to the agent where in the background, all the emotions are being processed, but at the same time, this is where the tactile sensation happens. Now, a uh, Sensation is created and sent to the other user who will then feel the touch that was initiated. Before they respond, data will be returned to the first user in the form of a response. And this movement of data, it, it all has to do with machine learning and data being collected from the sensors with not as much input from the users other than initiating touch is the idea. Now, emotional touch, this is verbal. In, in this one, what a person, user one saying isn't held up and being processed, it's heard, but the emotions behind what's being said, what's the, the, the body's reaction to what was said, those are things that will be computed in the background and somehow expressed in the avatars. So the same thing, awareness of in real life, one would look before one speak is, is, you know, <laughs> is, is the idea. You don't just say something. You, especially if you're sitting with a loved one and you're having a conversation, you're listening to what they're saying or maybe not saying, but their body language. And this is where emotional touch, the same thing. You get response from what was, what was said, what you said to them, how did they respond? on a deeper level and then compare, did it match? You know, that's, yeah. And the same thing. Now speech. So as I said before, the speech isn't stopped in process. It's just said, goes through, but it's captured in a way that the data is, is studied patterns. You know, an emotional state of the speaker is is looked at and update of the avatar. 
Now, physical touch. Uh, this is bumping into the world, bumping into another party in, in world. And the same thing, awareness of action. Or maybe they may not be in awareness because, so we're moving away from the two people sitting. Or maybe, maybe the two people sitting and you, your arm bump into the other person's arm. And that could be an example here. You're, you become aware when you bump because you will feel something. You'll feel the object or you feel the avatar and compare awareness to the matching feeling. And here is the overview. Since, so in the case of a physical object, additional sensors will be necessary for specific objects in world or to capture that data to be able to figure out, well, that was a plastic bar, a bottle, or that was a rock or concrete wall you just bumped into or whatever. Um, I'm sorry, I'm probably not answering questions, but I will get to them as soon as I go through everything, if that's okay. All right, now, physical emotions. This is where the underlying, based on, you know, say your pupils, the movement of your pupils, the dilation of your pupils can tell a lot, whether you're interested in what's going on or there's a, there's a whole ton of research on that, which I'm enjoying. <laughs> Anyways, so underlying emotions, it gives you a way to indicate what your next move should be, your next action, okay? And this is something that's happening in the background and we're not doing anything. It's the sensors are collecting and showing. So now background emotions, that's the sounds, the visual effects. And um, let's see, one of the things with the avatar that we're looking at is having a color, a, a glow to the avatar. So when they're happy, happy would be green. Red would be angry, or maybe white would be at peace. Uh, uh, not, not white, uh, just a colorless glow would be at peace. So in this case, this is another visual cue as to whether you should touch, not touch, talk, not talk. <laughs> um, it's just more information that you can capture visually. To, to help with your actions. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the agent, okay? Now, the steps that we're taking, working on, this is before we get to even applying, uh, connecting a haptic device. This is, this is that big ball of emotion study that I, I keep doing this like a little ball. <laughs> That's what the agent is. It's this big ball and sensors data is going into it and we process and spit out uh, an emotion. Ah, okay, that's, that's really horrible. <laughs> Anyhow, so to be able to implement touch in VR, and to understand the emotions that need to be recreated, deep research is necessary. Uh, this is something that's ongoing and it, it's not just computer science, it's other disciplines, it's psychology behind certain emotions and how certain things happen or don't happen or what's being said or not being said, this is, this is a, a multi um, multi field, field study that we're we're working on. Now the next step is facial expressions, um, creating a database for facial expressions and also uh, speech recognition. 
which is the next slide, but anyhow, and implementing the agent in, in that it's multiple pieces working together. That kind of, it's a, yeah. All right, so how? First off, we started with data sets, um, publicly available data sets to, to work through each different emotion and, and you know getting things working as the first step. Then there's the creation of the databases for the facial expression, speech recognition. Now with brain waves, creating data sets for that. Now I'm gonna take a, now is not the time, but later on I'll talk about some brainwave research that was done to capture pain, certain degrees of pain. So I'll go through that in a moment. Anyhow, collecting data uh, from the multiple. So before we, we um, implement, complete implementation of the agent, we need to have something working to, to recreate these emotions. Now in the VR experience, what we're hoping for is an online processing of this data, collecting data, processing, aggregating. it. So that's kind of the next big step after things get working. So. And the current setup, uh, Oculus Rift, I know that's the older version, but if you can work with an older version of something, get it working awesome, the new version will work fine. And the Oculus 2 just got it two days ago, it was using an older version, but this one has a little bit more. So here, collecting data from, sens um, from the sensors, the, uh, the Muse 2 allows for brain waves, heart rates, body and breath. With previous work, only use the brain waves. I didn't try using the accelerometer or the gyroscope data, but this next turn, that will be included. So let's see. Now the facial expression recognition that will require an update in the, um, the headset to one that does do eye tracking. Body gestures, to a certain degree, at this point, the full body movement is not as important as, as the brain waves, maybe head movement, speech, and facial. So those are the things we're gonna focus on. And with the eye tracking, being able to capture pupil dilation information, that would be, that's something, because when you're, when you're, your pupils, depending on how your pupils are, it can tell a lot about your emotions, whether you're interested in something or not. Uh, so there's that. And skin temperature, that's, that's a minor, well, <laughs> That's another area that we're looking at as well. So looking, let's just quick look at the sensor, older sensor. Notice I, um, I only use the EEG data, didn't use these two bits because I was trying to see how does the brain, how could you, using the brain information, brainwave information, capture an emotion, a, something that like pain, um, the different degrees of pain, as opposed to pain and no pain. We, we got some data on that. So here's, here's, okay. I was going to go through a very intense machine learning explanation, but my advisor said, no, just, just explain what we're doing. <laughs> so here, yeah. So using this data, okay, it's, um, there were, let's see, a sensor here, 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 and here, and I think right axis. There's the date, the time, 
and then the six, one, two, three, five um, pieces of data. Well, types of data. I was able to get these accuracies using these machine learning methods. And, you know, just off the top of the head, you know, well, maybe LSTM would be the ideal one for the project. But at this point, there's so many different pieces of data. There are so many different types of data being processed. Saying we're going to use one method throughout may not be the best way. So that was just a little look. <laughs> now, after the agent is solidified and working, um, the next step would be for the world creation. And maybe at that point, using buttons versus the haptic stimuli, just to say, well, we're trying to do happy, you know, and when initiating the touch, you hit happy, and it'll go through the process collecting data from all the different sensors and give you happy on the avatar. So that's one of the, the first next step. And then the final step will be to add haptic stimuli to it and see it working. So now we're gonna look at some related studies related uses of emotions, touch, simulated touch, simulated emotions in VR. And the first one is medicine. So there are, there was a, a chemotherapy treatment where, uh, I'm sorry, a study where emotions were monitored for chemotherapy um, patients and the idea was to keep the person in a more relaxed state. You know, they're going to going through something rather difficult and give them a more enjoyable state versus the reality of what they're doing. And use that to do psychological interventions to help with medication. Now, in these, this one, they used um, visual and auditory changes in the environment. And they found that it was less stressful and more calm. So that's, that's really cool. <laughs> now, another one, uh, a brain study involved a simulated um, roller coaster experience where there's a constant influx of emotionally arousing images, videos, and sounds. And they found that this was a more natural emotional experience outcome than other experiences. So <laughs> I thought that was cool. Now a really cool one is here, the Touch Museum. Now, when you see a piece of art, you, you the first thing you'll want to touch and being able to experience touch in such an environment is not only a good learning experience, it's a good emotional experience, I think. Anyhow, so <laughs> they use a mixture of real life and visual props. Um, minus segue. There was another um, research which I found that you're simulating being out, outside on grass. So you're standing on a physical prop, indoor uh, carpeting that's like grass material. And it, it really is pretty cool when there's a mixture of real life and visual props. So here they found that um, it increased the sense of presence and learning. You know, it, it got better results in terms of sense of presence. And let's see, sports. Now, facial expressions, a VR, uh, VR volleyball, where the avatars 
their facial expression change with what's going on in the world. If you watch a volleyball game, um, <laughs> the, the facial expressions change in real life. You know, when we're doing awesome, we're, our facial expression change. And it was, it was found that this created more believable and more, more believable characters. And it was a more engaging game. Now in education, there are, I think I have, there's five examples and I'll go through each, of, each one of them. So science, um, science college level immunology um, course, they use like a, sto a digital storytelling to engage and enhance learning. And with all of these, they are found to be more engaging. Now, the second one has to do with a shared haptic experience with a student and teacher where they're using a force and motion. Now, in reality, <laughs> I'm not sure about a VR dental appointment, but, but this was pretty cool, I thought. Uh, <laughs> but, the fact that they're using force and motion, that's pretty much closer to what we're trying to do than a lot of the others. So that was pretty cool. Another one, it's um, an online uh, virtual reality training for learning Japanese and having a facial expressions on the instructor to see if that would help with engagement. Now, having a fixed facial expression, no, but if it changes, it does make a difference. Now, another was a social inclusion uh, uh, grocery store e experiment where, where students with, um, and now I'm going to have to look at my notes for this one. <laughs> okay, so it's a customizable tool in VR for measuring social inclusion for neurodiverse students within a virtual supermarket. Now, this includes sensory stimuli. Now, good old emotions in VR. There's that. There's a, that's a pretty cool one, too. Now, the final one is a video game in VR for nursing students to teach them about emotions. <laughs> this one I thought was pretty cool too. Um, my, my love, what I do in real life, I make video games. So this one I thought was pretty cool. And the fact that nursing students to help them build their skills to identify, manage and understand emotions because they see us at our worst, you know? They don't see us when we're happy. They see us when people are sick and you need to be able to understand human emotions to be able to help. Um, but in all of these, it, it, there was more engagement. So that was pretty cool. Now, there were a lot of other examples, but these I thought each had a different bit that caught my attention. Now, the next one is retail. Everybody likes to shop for something, but they found that instances where they're shopping for a tool worked, but shopping for clothing was not so, was not so effective because you can't feel the fabric. You know, when you're shopping for something, it depends on what you're using it for. You want to feel the fabric. And this is where a touch would be necessary. Now, the future. This research started just before the pandemic. It, it started in 2019 that summer <laughs> or no, it started in January. I came back from vacation, started that fall. 
And anyways, my first paper got accepted, the conference got canceled. <laughs> so why, why is this even important? Before the pandemic, it was about bringing people closer together despite distance. It, it was about freedom of movement. I love to travel. I have a big family and I still love being with my kids, but I like to see the world. So for me, being able to move around and being in connection is very important. Then pandemic. <laughs> uh, we're talking about social distancing. So, you know, we need to be together, but afar. And here's where being able to hold our loved one's hand. I know this is about VR, but the data, the data works outside of VR as well. It, it's useful in VR, but what about outside in cases where there is a sense that's not there? How can we use this to help? Now, in a case where someone is in hospice and you can't, your family can't be there, wouldn't it be nice to have the feel of a hand, a family member hand holding you while, anyways, on to the next thing. After the pandemic, <laughs> I still believe in the freedom of movement and communication, even though we have a new norm of how things are. This is all about freedom, freedom of movement, and being able to be connected to your loved ones, no matter how far apart you are. And, you know, dealing with the loss of a sense, this, this technology could be helpful. Now, future works, wearable devices, um, object recognition via touch. Now, the physical touch portion where it's the person and um, an inanimate object being able to recognize objects, that would be really good. Touch between avatars, you're in game playing and you don't just bowl over your... Now, here's a neat scenario that would be really interesting. As you're playing and you bump into someone, they fall and you're able to reach out and help them up. I know Sounds like daydreams, okay. <laughs> I could see the clouds, yeah, but anyways. Smart textiles, you know, a more cost-effective and accessible solution to implementing touch and VR. That's the future from my cave. Now, conclusion, emotions are a multi-dimensional construct. It's based on so many things. Now, so far I've said it's based on your, your environment, your physical and all these things, but what about your memories and things? Those don't come into play here, but there's just so much. And touch, it's a tactile sensation. More body coverage, more possibilities of what we can do. And yeah. Thank you for listening. I hope I didn't bore you to Hades, you know, but if you have any questions, we're open for questions and I'll turn off my screen. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so I'm open to questions and Hi, Darlene. Um, Hi. It was really interesting. Thank you for that. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of making these things a bit more. Sorry, my hat's a bit crooked. It's okay. Not <laughs> measuring. <noticed>. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering how to make um, these haptic devices maybe a bit more ubiquitous and like to be able to um, express a, a variety of emotions because, um, you know, if we have like 
full body suits that are not exactly you know accessible for everyone so mm -hmm. Because I've done a bit of work in this space as well, using haptic devices, and, and mm -hmm. you know we had a vest and and all this sort of stuff. But mm -hmm. you know, um, and often um, participants, it's real cumbersome for them to put all this stuff on. And so, do you see any um, ways to to really um, to use stuff that can um, that's not so um, bulky or like difficult to access or expensive and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, I came across a study where they were using pieces of um, material. Um, I think it was, I don't think it was fabric. It was just this little strips. And I was thinking, what if we, we did this and use a little bit of Velcro? And if, say you're sitting talking to your loved one, maybe the arm, you put a strip here, a strip here, but you still, you're going to have your heart monitor, your um, brain this guy yep. <laughs> on your yep. head you're going to have your vr thing on and uh i think that's probably all and then you just put the strip on maybe different places that mm. that's kind of an idea but it's kind of daydreaming ideally yeah. what i think would be nice is to have fabric okay say you put a t-shirt on a long sleeve t-shirt but then what about the hands, <laughs> gloves? You know, say you had something that's fold up and you can put it in the little box, you put it on and you go into VR. Mm. Maybe plug that in, you know, something like that would be interesting, but I know I sound crazy, but I, I think fabric is probably the best way. It's movable, lightweight. And not mm. all these big, bulky, cushy things, and you look like you're Martian, you know? Who's yeah. going to want to interact that way, you yeah. know? So, and I, I think some, some smart fabrics have the ability to kind of constrict, and then like that could kind mm -hmm. of simulate, like, you know, maybe like a hand going up an arm or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yes, yeah. Or even if it is just um, gloves, you know, like, um, you know, touching hands is quite mm -hmm. a nice yeah. interaction. Yes. Yeah. 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 I guess the other one would be, you know, um, if you're interacting with um, like uh, non-human agents, and you know, mm -hmm. having an experience with, um, you know, virtual um, non-player characters, and being able to interact with them on a higher level, mm -hmm. that could also be kind of interesting. Yeah. 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 But here's the thing the the interaction is like the last part there's just so much emotions and things to and i keep doing this i'm, I'm not an alchemist i'm not dr strange oh yeah i'm strange okay i'm dr strange wannabe <laughs> <laughs> but, but just imagine all these bits of data you know i i did a, a pain um detecting pain uh, using the the muse um, heads, uh, brain waves, and mm -hmm. basically we collected data when someone had headaches, someone didn't, someone had massive migraines, and we were able to get a ninety something percent accuracy. Wow! You know, with with using it, so so I'm just thinking there's a lot to be done with the good old brain waves. And mm -hmm. the headset, I think HP's new headset, um, Omni, Omni, oh God, the latest one, the one that I want for $1,200 and I've been bugging my advisor for, and he's gonna watch <laughs> this. I've been um, nicely asking for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. I think it's so, the Reverb G2. Yeah, yes, yes. It has eye tracking. Um, yeah. Yeah, they were at GDC last year and I, I fell in love. But then, it, yeah, anyways, but, but they have a lot that they track and tracking the pupil that can give us a lot of information. Um, right. So, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, cool. I look forward to what you can produce. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is all basis of my first paper not my first contribution paper that I'm hoping to get published by June. So 
it it's before I was all focused on we need to do touch we need to do touch and yesterday mm. speaking to my advisor I realized I'm a computer scientist there's so much that needs to be done before yeah there's the Doctor Strange thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, I've, I've, I feel there's a big no, well, not such a disconnect. I mean, we're aware of the whole psychology side of it in, mm -hmm. in terms of human emotions, but um, I don't know if we in, engage enough with the psychologists or maybe we need to create a stronger link there. Yeah. So I think a lot of what we do is structured around psychology because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I come from a computer science background as well. And I just mm -hmm. acknowledge that. So we've just got to um, marry the two um, fields a mm -hmm. bit stronger together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when this started, I was taking a VR course where it was a hybrid between the art department and computer science. At the beginning, there was a lot of computer science students. At the end, there were two. Mm. And it gave me a new look at what we do. You know, what we do is affected by and affect everything else. You know, we are not to sound big, oh boy, not to sound big in the head mm. but the the emotions the the underlying stuff there's a lot of data and that's where computer science comes in and if we can get help from those other fields you know understanding what it means when when say a person is quiet but their blood pressure is high but mm. they look okay Dear God, they're not happy, you know? Yeah. And by studying those underlying emotions, we can understand, you know, maybe not be a psychologist about it, but understand what it is that's happening and be able to make better systems is, is the idea. Um, yeah. yeah. Not to sound too computer science-y, but I called it the agent because I was thinking of um, the matrix, Neo, you know, it's, I can't, I don't have a name for it yet. You know, mm. I thought of my first initial and my advisor's first initial and touch, but that sounds weird, you know, but <laughs> it's, I don't know what to yeah. call it. It's not like a kid, you know, you know what to call a kid, but this is something more. It's, mm. I think the, the more we get into it, it'll be closer to understanding what exactly we call it you know, other than yeah. the agent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you'll um, find a nice term for it. Yeah. I, I hope I went thing. into enough details. I didn't want to overbug it with, this is what the data look like. This Did I give enough interesting enough? <laughs> I think you covered a lot of spectrum there. And I mean, especially because you touched on the communication part too. And, and yeah, just within that, um, you know, there's the underlying, like, you know, tone or like, mm -hmm. you know, the way people are, you know, they, I don't know, they might not want to talk because they're not feeling good, but, you know, they look good. Mm -hmm. So there's like this really hidden um, information. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, so that's quite an interesting point there too. And I don't think that's really well looked into. So like the, um, you know, the, the hidden hidden lines mm -hmm. sort of in our in our brains our brains don't lie you know mm. it doesn't and we can say what we want to say because of our conditioning or what we're trying to present to the world like today i did not um comb my hair this is my einstein look <laughs> and i i wanted to focus on i'm here to deliver my message not about the aesthetics not yeah. to put a business suit on or whatever which is what i did yesterday for my my um test run with my advisor and he was like no <laughs> that's not, that's not you. you you know <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, is cool. me. so yeah. i want to be able to create ways for us to communicate who we are being okay with who we are and, and when we're not, maybe learn a little bit, you know, that mm. we're not being who we really are. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 yeah, I felt the same, like, you know, you go to a conference in person, you know, you dress up in your fancy gear and all that. But, it's mm -hmm. like... but you're not being yourself. My advisor, what he said was, 
think of it as this is your story. You're telling the story of your research and you're at a cocktail party presented mm. that way. And he has to remind me a lot because I, I have this idea. I'm supposed to, I'm representing this. And I need to look this way. No, no, no. Yeah. I wanted to tell a story and hopefully it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? I um I also well this is being recorded so my email and my professor's email is on there at the end of the the presentation um, any thoughts on this research you can always reach out you know I've had the school email for a few decades because I've gotten a few degrees from the school and I keep saying I'm not going back and I do go back so. <laughs> So it's, it's still there. So, yeah. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. No more questions? No. Jacob, did I, did I do it in the right amount of time? Yeah, yeah that was early even, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was trying um, to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks everyone. All right. So time to go. All right. Bye. I'm going to go have coffee now. <laughs> Enjoy.